So my name is Tom Cotton. I've been here in Harvard um, almost 40 years. Some people you know, in the family wondered why we wanted to be out here in, the, in the, this quiet area where we should probably more, as, as youngsters, be in like Watertown or Waltham or something. But, um, you know, where I grew up, there was a, some undeveloped land down the street for me. There was a gravel pit with a lot of woods around it, and you could just go down there and hang out and, you know, watch the, you know, the guys load the trucks or... In the wintertime, we'd take a toboggan sliding down the uh, slope of the gravel bank, so that was always exciting. I enjoy wandering out in the woods, um, you know, on town land or trust land. Um, I have a neighbor who's, you know, that owns, you know, some pri you know, private property behind me, and they let me go wander out there. There's a little swamp out there that you can, you know, the beavers have a little lodge out there. So it's, it's fun to go out there and, um, you know, see the wildlife. But, yeah, there's always... I always like to be closer to open space and woods than being in a congested area. Off in college, my dad one day when I came back said, hey, take, go drive down the road and see what they're doing. And it, you know, they're taking this open field area that was open from the road down to the Merrimack River, and they're building houses in it. And I'm like, ah. So seeing some of the changes, we you know, as stuff gets developed, that sort of some motivation for me to um, work to protect the open space. And, you know, the house I'm in now, when we bought it, the previous owner um, wanted to spend a couple hours with me walking the land, going through the woods, explaining, you know, why they took down certain trees. You know, they, you know, took out a lot of the pine to open up light to the house, but they left the trees up close to the house so that, you know, deciduous trees so that it could shade the house. And because um, he designed the house as passive solar. So it's, it was interesting to hear his thoughts on, you know, why he left certain species of trees and took other, other trees out. And so that got me thinking more about, um, you know, how to protect things and how the the uh, ecosystem works. The Conservation Trust was established 50 years ago. Um, you know, five, the five founders were, you know, concerned that as development, you know, which was development would start encroaching on and taking away some of the open space that they all, everyone all loved and enjoyed. Um, and also they would, you know, figured it would be a good way to help educate people, you know, preserve some of the wetlands. Um, maybe preserve some of the agricultural properties somehow. So they, you know, they, they got together, um, created the trust. And so one of the things the trust can do, you know, one of the things they did back then, they could move quickly on a project. You know, if a parcel came up that the town was interested in preserving and the trust thought it was worthy of pre preserving, but the seller wanted to close in three months. The trust could go borrow money. You know, one of the trustees would sign, they'd borrow money, they would acquire the property and then work with the town to transfer it to the town. When the town, after they went through their town meeting process and had funds in place. I was a member of it when I moved in. I joined it, but I wasn't actively involved until about the mid-90s, um, you know, when the, you know, the family is somewhat established and the career is established, and I felt I could, um, you know, take some time and get involved in the community. The Conservation Trust used to have a small Christmas tree farm on West Bay Hill Road at the May property we own at the corner of West Bay Hill and Warren Ave. And, um, you know, I met you know, some neighbors that were working at the, you know, the Christmas tree sale um, and, you know, talked to them about the trust. And so that got me thinking about it. And it's like, okay, I want to get more involved. And I, you know, had to reach out and, you know, volunteer for things. And then they said, oh, you want to, you know, join the board? And it's like, yeah, I'll join the board.
HCT over the years, like back in the mid 2000s, did a, a large capital campaign in which they raised some funds that they used internally as like a revolving loan. So if they had a, the opportunity to acquire a property, instead of doing, they would do some fundraising to help acquire it, but they would also tap their revolving loan fund to help them do the project. Um, since then, back in 2016, Erhard Muller, uh, who was one of the founders of the trust, left the trust a bequest of one and a half million dollars for specifically for land protection. And his only caveat was, you, for every dollar you wanted to take out to spend, you had to raise a dollar. Um, so that helped us. You know, on one hand, we look at it and say it's challenging to go raise money, um, but it's I th if you have an, a I think some donors, when you're raising money for a project, um, you know, they're excited that someone's gonna, gonna match it. And so that helped us with the Haas Metal Knowles project. Um, you know, between, I, I don't think if we had the Muller Fund in hand, that would have been a tough project to, to tackle. Um, and, even, and even with the Muller project, you, you know, we, internally set how much we wanted to let Mullock match. And so there was still additional funds needed after the match. And um, we reached out to the Sudbury Valley trustees and the regional land trust and um, worked with them and sold them a conservation restriction on the parcel. So, you know, even though the trust owns the underlying fee, the, the development rights of the parcel have been transfer it to Sudbury Valley trustees. Um, so that's an, that's an example of us starting to look out and look around and seeing who can we partner with to make projects work. In Still River, the, the Watt brothers ran a dairy farm that had land on both the east and west of Still River Road and land on north and south of Still River Depot Road going down to the Nashua River. And at this time in the mid-90s, late 90s, the, the fort had already turned some of the, their land over to the Fish and Wildlife Service to create the Oxbow. And the Watt brothers' farm the upland fields leading, you know, flowing down, you know, going downhill to the Nashua were adjacent to it. And there was a, you know, they had 130 acres on that side um, going down to the, going down to the, um, to the Oxbow. And then Fish and Wildlife was interested in trying to see that preserve because it was open upland, which is good for game birds and other uh, animals that, that um, they wanted to try to see to protect. So the Conservation Trust took an option on some of that land over there that the Watts owned. And in the Conservation Trust, knowing it was a, a very large project and a very expensive project, um, partnered with the Trust for Public Land and got them involved. We transferred the option to acquire the land to the Trust for Public Land, and then they worked with um, the liaisons down in Washington, D.C. to advocate f for the Fish and Wildlife Service to get funding to purchase it. So um, that 130 acres in Still River that was part of the Watt Farm, you know, the trust was, the, um, was involved in getting that launched. And it's one of those projects that people don't always remember because it's not owned by the trust, it's not owned by the town, it was absorbed into the Oxbow, you know, Oxbow there.
prior to the Mueller receiving the gift from Erhat Mueller, you, land acquisition from, say, the mid-2000s to 2015, there's, there's maybe two, two pieces, I think, maybe three. But getting the gift from Erhat has enabled us to be a little more uh, proactive or you know, being more comfortable taking on projects. And I, the other thing I think is, is we've tackled some of the big ones like Hoss Metal Knowles. Anyone who walks out there and sees the, the reservoir there um, on the Gillette property that's adjacent to it, um, it's like, wow. Yeah, the you know, Hospital Knowles was a project. Um, there were a couple of small projects back in the 90s in which someone may have had a five-acre parcel adjacent to conservation land, and they wanted to donate it to the Conservation Trust as opposed to the town. So we've, this, you know, if you look at a map of conservation land, you'll see like some scattered parcels about it. It's like, you know, why is that two-acre parcel out in the middle of nowhere? Why is it conservation land? It's like, well, someone wanted to give it to the trust, and we said, sure. <laughs> So that's another focus that the trust has been doing as part of their land acquisitions is also looking at connections. How can we connect a couple parcels together? And like um, when we bought the piece off of West Bear Hill recently, we got a um, trail easement from the owner to go, from, or one of the owners, or an abutting owner to go from the West Bear Hill piece out to Bolton Road. So you can, you know, if you were on Warren Ave, you can go through the Callahan piece, go, go through the edge of the orchard and then pop out on Bolton Road and go into town conservation land. So it's, it's little connections like that that, that um, we're, we're also trying to focus on. There is a, a piece of farmland that isn't being farmed. It's the, you know, the Carlson land on Littleton County Road that had been an orchard and it's being used by, I think, um, Jim Pickard from Littleton growing some corn there. But the, um, the, the current plan is that the Conservation Trust will purchase the agricultural land and then sell a conservation restriction on it to the town to help fund it, and then the, the Conservation Trust will be identifying a farm, farm group that will license and use the lands. So it's not all, that, that parcel isn't all ag land. Some of the land in the back is wooded and it, and it butts some of the eastern greenway. So again, back in there, it's more um, protecting a wildlife corridor. The trust does hold, in addition to land and conservation restrictions on land, we hold a historic preservation restriction on the, uh, the remains of the stone barn, the, Sh the Shaker Stone Barn on South Shaker Road. We're always looking for volunteers. Um, I haven't been in, involved in um, organizing the current projects. There's a couple other people on the that are current trustees that are excited and handle that. Um, I know that they they work with the Bromfield School and a number of the seniors to get hours for community service who will volunteer and help with the trust. So whether it's trail maintenance or 
um, you know, invasive species, you know, work. They, they, you know, they get them, get them some hours, and and, it, and so it gets them out, and they get to see and experience, you know, some time in the woods. And. And I think, you know, there's, there's probably a few parcels that don't have trails on them because, you know, the habitat is too sensitive and it was decided we're going to leave that for the, for the animals. And it's nice to have land that's protected for the animals that use it. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to have, a, you know, the, this, this conserved land for... Um, you know, the, the trees can sequester carbon, um, and it just, you know, and it, it, and it may bring solace to people who go walking on them. It's just, you know, a, a way to, you know, step out of your house, step into the woods, and just take a deep breath and enjoy the tranquility, you know, you listen for the birds, you look for the birds, you know, look at the mushrooms growing up. It's just... Um, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity to step out and unwind. You know, once you start walking the land and you see something, it's like, oh yeah, that, that looks like something I saw over there. And, um, and it's like, you know, that, ledge, that exposed legend at Brown, if you look at that and look at the coloring of it and the grain in it, and you go over to Horse Metal Knolls and you walk up the old driveway and use the, some spots where the, it's exposed to the ledge, you realize that looks very familiar. <laughs> you know, it looks like the stuff back at, you know, Brown Burgess, or Burgess Brown, rather. It's just, so, it's all, and it, it's interesting, it's just, you know, then you start thinking about the, the, the geology that makes up half it, and then you discover, oh, there's this guy, Neil Jorgensen, who lived here in town, who has written a book about the geology, I think, in you know, other things in Massachusetts. So then, then you go pick up his book and read that, and then you go read another book. And so. Well, I was born in France. Uh, I grew up in Normandy, uh, and uh, so I grew up in a in a city, a small city, but I was surrounded by nature. So nature has always been very, very important to me. We were looking for another place to live that would be closer, and we happened to drive through Harvard, and I told my husband, this is where I want to live because it reminded me so much of home. The orchards, the stone walls, the horses, and I said, this is home to me. I have to live here. So I've been in this town for 24 years, and I love it. I think it's a wonderful place to be. I think Harvard has, has kept um, a lot of its integrity, and I think mostly due by the conservation land. I like to paint landscapes, of course, uh, but when I first started, um, I, I did a lot of still lives because um, to me, still lives, whether they are flowers or fruit, vegetable, they're still part of nature. You know, they, they are gorgeous in their own way and they are really wonderful to paint. So I did a lot of still lives for a long time. I still do them. I like to hike. Um, and nature really fascinates me uh, in any weather condition. I, I walk regardless, regardless of weather. Uh, I have done paintings coming out of a blizzard. <laughs> you know, I got caught in a blizzard once, and uh, 
And, uh, but it inspired me, you know, during the pandemic. Um, as I said, I, I had a routine every day. I was going out no matter what. <laughs> and I knew a storm was coming. And, uh, but I thought, you know, I'll have time. You know, it's not coming until later. I'll just go for my walk. And I kind of forgot myself. I walked longer than, than I should have. And on my way back, I really got caught in the sleet. The, 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 I mean, I was, so, I was drenched. <laughs> And I got to my street, and I, as I turned into my street, you could barely see. I mean, it was, the, the, it was really a blizzard. But in the distance, there was a person, tiny little person, over at the end of the street walking. And I thought, I am not the only fool walking in this weather. And I just loved the scene, so I took my camera, I took a few pictures, went home, dried myself, went to my studio, sketched it and painted it. So it's a very tonal painting uh, because it, it's a lot of grays, but uh, you know, all kinds of different grays, pink grays, blue grays, pink, uh, green grays. And uh, it's a wonderful painting. It's one of my favorite paintings because it was really meaningful to me uh, just to know that, you know, in desperate times, like during the, the COVID and the pandemic, um, people needed, needed to be doing something, even in terrible weather. And uh, I was not the only one. <laughs> so I, I retired from my career in 2015, and I focused on, on my art. But I really saw the change in my art with the pandemic, because, um, there was nothing else to do but be home, uh, paint, and uh, I painted every day, and it made a lot of difference. And I considered myself very, very lucky to live here because um, when people in the cities couldn't go outside, people were afraid everywhere, and it was a very difficult time for everybody. Being in Harvard, I could go outside and not be fearful because there was nobody around. You know, a lot of times I would walk, um, do trails or walk around town, um, take photographs, sketch very quickly. I was alone and it was a gift. It was a gift to me uh, during that time because it was a very difficult time for so many people. That's when my art really started to uh, take real meaning for me. And I haven't stopped since. <laughs>
um, the stream and the pond. Uh, so I love that area as well. The beauty of being an artist is that it, uh, it forces you to see and to look at your surroundings in a completely different way. Um, people take, take nature and their surroundings for granted, but, but they don't stop really to really look. Um, when you are an artist, I think you look at the shape of a cloud. Uh, you look at, at, at the color um, of, of the grass or the, the snow. Um, you, you look at the way the sun hits uh, on a certain angle on the side of a, a house. Or it, you, you really see things uh, because you can't help it. It's a, because that's, that's what your mind does. That you, you're looking for inspiration and nature is there to give it to you uh, all the time. It's uh, never boring. Um, I have painted the same area um, multiple times, and none of the paintings are the same. For example, uh, I paint Fruitlands a lot, the Overlook, and I could paint that, sing, that scene 365 times, and none of them would be the same, because it's different every time. The sunsets are different, uh, the seasons are different, um, so, you know, inspiration is everywhere, if you look. <laughs>
so global warming is creeping up uh, everywhere. I mean, it's, it, if you don't understand that, and if you don't understand how to protect nature, we're heading for catastrophe. To me, it's a no-brainer to understand that you need to protect, as I said, your nest. You depend on it. You depend on it for food. You depend on it uh, for your well-being. Um, and if people are ignorant uh, about this, um, the only thing I can advise is, you know, take a walk and go to, you know, to the forest or, um, you know, learn to appreciate your surroundings. I consider nature our human nest, and um, we need to protect it for our own uh, survival. If you don't, if if you destroy your land and nature, um, you gradually destroy destroy yourself. You know, we depend on it. Nature will do what it does uh, with with us or without us. It doesn't need us. We need it, so uh, that's why I think it's important to have uh, conservation land. I moved here in 2001, so 20 years, 20 plus years. I was in Groton. I was leaving Groton because I was getting a divorce. I have three children. They were teeny, teens then. I thought I would rent something, but I also needed a studio. So it became difficult to find. And a friend of mine who knew, heard that I was looking for a place to live, called me up and she said, you need to go to Harvard. I hadn't really thought of Harvard. And she gave me the address, the house that I should go see. And it was the house she, where she grew up. And she loved it. Like, it was very close to her and still is. And she is still very close to me. Um, in fact, we had storytelling at the farm two years ago. We have it every year, but two years ago, she came and told a story of her childhood there, which was really amazing. But she said, go there. And I went. And it was just... It's a beaut it's I mean at the time it was run down and like just mud season, there was nothing in bloom, nothing green, but there was something that was magical. There's a big pond and then there's a waterfall and then there's a lower pond and then there's a channel where the water all goes out to the um, large Delaney. Um, fish and wildlife property. Um, yeah, there was just something about it. And then there were chickens. I mean, I wasn't looking to be a farmer. I'm not sure one necessarily always knows what one's looking for. And sometimes the universe has something in mind. I had been, um, I was part of, very active member of the Groton Conservation Trust, and I was also chairman of a tree planting group. In fact, I had been to Harvard because I spoke with um, um, Earhart Muller about tree planting, because we had a very successful tree planting organization from the early, sometime early 80s, really. Um, we called it Friends of the Tree Warden. So we were working with the Tree Warden and with the DPW to get trees planted on all the main streets and throughout the town. As part of the Conservation Trust, we were talking about farmland and the disappearance of farmland. And that disappearance of farmland changes 
the entire landscape of New England. Like we need farms. Besides that we need food. <laughs> like people forget we actually grow our food and we eat from the land. As an artist, I was feeling, wow, what can we do? And I decided I would make an artwork about the disappearance of farmland. And so I put a little notice in our local paper, artists looking for old agricultural tools for an artwork about the disappearance of farmland. And people called up, like um, a, a scythe, you know, that belonged to their grandfather, or a large saw, or um, just all these different tools. And so I started doing these pieces, large pieces. I mean, they had to be the scale of the tools. And so my, that first series was called the Agricultural Tool Series. And so before even thinking or knowing I was like gonna get a divorce and I was gonna move, I was working with tool, farm tools. And then I come to, to, to see this property and then I learn, well, there's a tractor that comes along with the, <laughs> with the farm. And um, Art Spalding was very sweet. The prior owner, he gave me a tractor driving lesson. I mean, I didn't know anything about <laughs> driving a tractor, but I certainly needed it. Um, so, uh, you know, I didn't really choose it, but s like you put these things together and there I was. We became the first um, organic pick your own orchard in Massachusetts. We get picked out no matter how many, how large a crop we have, because there are, there are you know, there's a certain population that come out from Boston. Cambridge who want to pick organic apples. I think we're all really creative. I think human beings are creative. And for me, I am most happy when I am connected to that place of creativity. Like it's really important for me. If too much time goes by and I'm doing kind of things that don't connect me, I start to feel lost. But um, so being an artist, I'm being truthful to who I am as a person. Yeah. And, um, and I'm growing through that expression and sharing through that expression. So the medium doesn't matter as much. I love making art. <laughs> yeah. And writing. I mean, so it doesn't, it comes out you know, in different ways. I'm writing a new book now. So I, I did write a book, um, a memoir, um, The Artist and the Orchard. But I'm now writing a, a second book that is, um, the narrator is one of the trees in the orchard, a golden delicious tree. And the golden delicious tree does have an orchardist and their orchardist comes and sits on one of their low horizontal branches. Sometimes she brings a book, but otherwise they, they just, they talk, they have conversations. And the tree is quite wise and yet innocent. And um, so it's really fun to write. <laughs> so that's my new um, project that I'm working on. There's a, um, a series of small sculptures that are on in, out on the trail around the pond. And I, had, I made them very small. So small bronze figures that are sitting, kind of sitting in meditation or just kneeling. And I put them on, I put a few of them on a large stone, just these small figures. And then around a few other stones with figures. And um, people love this piece, like they go by. And I wasn't sure it would work really at first because they're so small and you think, oh, they'll just be lost, but they aren't. Like we actually relate to them, I think more directly because of that small size. In a sense, it's more true 
that it, it is the way we relate to the natural world. We aren't huge, you know, we're, we're not the size of an oak tree. We're quite small. And so um, I feel like when I'm putting work out for people, it's so that, it, like in that case, they can just, f it takes them inside themselves into what it feels like to be sitting on a rock, just sitting, yeah. We share this earth, I really believe that. And um, humans have changed the face of the earth more than any other creature, right? So we have a responsibility to to take care of these other creatures, yeah. After college, I went to Japan. I went to Japan to study mime and no theater. You know, no theater is one of the Zen arts and I was reading these Zen poets, and I was living in Kyoto, where I lived for two years, at a very formative time in my life, and I had a lot of time to just roam and see and look and go through. There's 500 temples in Kyoto, and they're all landscaped, and there's just so much beauty, and it's connected to spirit. That was really the, the influence that um, gave me that really um, very connected appreciation. I love being outside. I love being um, barefoot. <laughs> It's really important to have enough land that we can connect these parcels mm -hmm. and not to have isolated, yes, what you, you protect what you can, but to have these links so that the animals have a way to really travel. And um, that's really an important part. So the importance of land and land preservation, right? And conservation. And, um, I think especially on the East Coast and areas where land property values are getting to be higher and higher, if we don't preserve them, then they're all going to be gobbled up. I think it's really important so that everyone has access to land, and that if we don't, you're going to really limit who has access. And um, so it's, it's really important that we start thinking about um, the larger community and farmers, young farmers who, who want to farm in this area. They need, they need help to, they can't afford to like pay taxes on land and then have a crop failure. I mean, it's just, it doesn't work. There has to be, it's so wonderful when um, there are conservation organizations that are offering young farmers land so that they can, they can develop that. And I think that's a really important and wonderful um, piece. And in Harvard, we have, you know, the, the orchard up on Prospect Hill. And so, and there's a lot of volunteers there. And so all of that food is going to support people who otherwise wouldn't have access to fresh food. We bought a, uh, a, an old farmhouse that uh, came with 110 acres of land. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was more than, uh, it was a house, plus two barns and a workshop and a, a, a whole lot of good stuff. The only trouble was that there was no plumbing, electricity, or, 
well, anything. <laughs> uh, after living there for 40 years, bringing up our three kids who really flourished there. One of our kids is a real tree hugger. You know, I mean, she's really into, um, I mean, all sorts of spiritual things that have come from, and and is starting a group where, which is getting people from the city to go and work with the land. And I I think she really got that start from the, all the land that we had huge fields around us and um, we had gardens and I would say. By 1958, Bill Westcott died, and so that great orchard was sold off, and now it's, you know, lots and lots of houses. Well, that was, you know, reality. Um, I can remember some of the neighbors trying to think, well, how can we raise $25,000? You know, well, we couldn't, so it went, went to a developer. And then another dear friend of ours um, was approached by a developer and said, oh, you know, I really want to build a house up there on your land across the street. Could you sell me some? And he was very gullible. Sure. Okay, then Partridge Hill Road went in and, 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 and all these. And so that we saw this, we observed what was happening. I was a horseback rider and had horses, so. I used to ride through all these trails, through the orchards, and one of our favorite spots was something called the Enchanted Meadow, which is down off of um, Westcott Road, as you approach Stowe. Now, we tried to block that from being sold off, because it was really a beautiful area. Well, we didn't have any money. We'd but spend no, all our money to buy a place yeah, to live. No, but no, nobody had that much. Yeah, but the developers would come in and say, oh, this is nice. Um, up at Heart's Content, which is at the top of Bolton Road, near where Jenna lives, that had the most beautiful view looking out, and that land came up for sale, and that, that it went. So we saw what was happening, and, and Frank got, yeah, got The involved. reason for preserving land is because if you don't preserve it, it's going to get ruined, and, and you can't re re-establish it in its beautiful yeah. you setting look, the way yeah. it has now. So, I mean, that's pretty pretty easy, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, and this is a pretty big town geographically, but it only had 5,000 people in it when we came here. And uh, thank goodness we had zoning laws by then. But when we moved here in 1953, it was... It was Sort of a jungle. I mean, the the town dump was uh, was open 24 hours a day and smoldering away there, and nobody seemed to care. And I, I once we bought this old farmhouse, this old farm which had a, a three barns, and part of the deal was that uh, I'd clean out all the barns, uh, and. Um, so I cleaned out one of the barns and threw some stuff from the barn loft, and it burst into flame on the on the town dump. And this was about eleven o'clock at night or something. And so I called somebody, and somebody answered the phone. And I said, "Gee, I just lit the the dump on fire." And he said, "Oh, don't worry about it. It'll just get rid of some of the rats." <laughs> I mean. And there was no building inspector, and so we'd bought this old house and was trying to fix it up. And, and nobody came around to inspect. I mean, I yeah, wasn't he, that handy a carpenter or anything. Um, we we just benefited from the fact that the town was so liberal at that time. Um, but, that's true. Uh, it was very lucky that um, more awful things didn't happen. Yeah, no, but... <laughs> Yeah, and so these trails are very were very important, um, and I think the horse the horse people kind of helped uh, develop the trails. Um, I 
I think we saw what that what 495 did. I mean, we remember very vividly what the land was, you know, what it was like before 495. Yeah. And they really, um, our end of town where it went, went through, there was a lot of, um, you know, you no longer had people having teepees in the woods. You no longer would find wild pigs wandering through the woods when you were horseback riding. Um, so that was the beginning of, wow, you know, civilization is coming out to Harvard. You did have some wonderful um, <laughs> characters out here who didn't believe in rules and regulations. <laughs> and, and I'll do whatever I damn well please, thank you. Yeah. And in fact, um, we used to see um, these great big um, trucks going down Brown Road at, in the night. Yeah, they, they were emptying their. And they were emptying something. They were emptying their oil, and so when that when that land was developed in Bolton, it's all on the Bolton line. They had some problems. They had a big cleanup yeah, problem. Big cleanup there, so that was why rules and laws and regulations are important to protect um, land mm -hmm. from being um, ruined, um, conservation-wise, of water quality. The Harvard Conservation Trust flourished to an extent that I never would have dreamt could have happened. I mean, it was not, a, I don't think every town that tries it will have that good fortune. But the people we attracted to make it work yeah. were the, Fascinating. the cream of the cream in yeah. the town. It just, I couldn't believe what wonderful people yeah. came and worked their tails yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, amazing. I think also, you know, 495, 128, so there were some uh, professors coming out and there were a lot of um, uh, scientists yeah. c coming to Harvard. It was a, um, a an interesting type of group. Two of, the, two of these young people were... Uh, on the Conservation Commission in Harvard. And in that role, they were exposed to what the town of Groton was doing. And Groton had the first uh, zoning. Zoning. Yeah. Well, and they, you happen they, to know. They had the first conservation trust. Oh, okay. In the area, yeah. and they did a beautiful yeah. job in the town. I don't know if you know the town of Groton well at all, but it's been beautifully preserved. These two guys who were just—it was the first one in the area—and uh, so he went around and called uh, those two guys. Went and called around the Groton group, and they said, "Oh, yeah, you—we'll give you all our papers, and you just copy them and." <laughs> So we formed we formed the trust in 1972. That was Larry and and uh, Earhart Muller went, and went, went and called on Groton. Yeah. 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 So that was a big stimulus, having them there. Well, Earhart, Larry, uh, Anderson, Squibb, Anderson, and me. Bob Anderson. And Anderson was a, a businessman, much respected in town. Everybody. He was very helpful to people trying to raise capital for their businesses and stuff like that. So he had a very good reputation. But only uh, a matter of months after we, after '72, when we started, uh, he moved sold his business and moved out of town. I didn't know Earhart at all. Uh, and uh, Larry was a good friend, and he was sort of, they came to town not too much differently than we were, I think. And later, yeah. They were a little later, yeah. but they were my very much involved in town. Mm -hmm. And then Ed Squibb, <laughs> he, he grew up in the same town I did, and he's a 
two, three years older than me, and he was a character then, and more of a character when he came to Harvard. <laughs> and uh, he'd always say he'd do something, and uh, it didn't say when, and uh, so it could be quite a while later. Uh, he had a job in Boston as an engineer in Cambridge, actually, and he had to, he had to, that, he had to be responsible to them, and he loved working on old cars and stuff, and, and um, so he'd come and really do a job very well, but it might be three years left after he said he'd do it, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And Larry did his thing, and I did my thing. Did you have was, meetings? You must have oh, meetings. Oh, yeah, we, we had monthly meetings. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, don't think I remember Earhart at any monthly meeting. Um, uh, Larry would um, come occasionally, but we each had our own sort of, sort of niche. There were some we great leaders, I think, in the community who were very well, at, you know, very bright and had a lot of drive and passion. So they um, got things done. It was not a lazy group. We had something called, for instance, a human rights group, which talked about and, uh, um, what we could do to for our kids to make them be aware of what was going on in the cities. But um, yeah, and they were. The League of Women Voters, the League was very powerful, and they brought out uh, Charles Elliott to know your town, get that, got that started, it was the League. And the League was, um, Elsie shot, um, his husband was on the planning board, and yeah, they were all, they were all friends, because it was a, through the League, you know, I think the women and the men got, We yeah we'd put on a the couples a, a club thing that called was, the couples yeah, club which that was, was a riot. part of the Unitarian yeah. Church, and we'd put on plays plays yeah. so, some that were legitimate Shakespeare but mostly written by one of the guys Local. who would come come moved in people who had looked on this area as a kind of a, a, a summer place and. There were quite a few of them who were rather wealthy from other towns. And uh, so there was, there was a lot of financial support. Well, yeah, a lot of single ladies who had money and they didn't have any kids, so they left. I was thinking of someone like Pam Smith. Um, and I remember calling, making my first call and I was told to do this. Uh, go, go out and raise some money, Frank. So <laughs> I went and called on a woman I knew who uh, didn't really have much money and told her, I said, we were starting this organization, we really, really need some help. And to my amazement, she gave me 150 bucks, yeah. which seems like nothing today, but th that was a lot of money back in 1953. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was 1972, I misspoke. Yeah, it was. 1972. Williams. It was on the road from the center of town to the pond, and uh, somebody somebody wanted to buy that lot because it was attractive, uh, and so that was our first purchase. And uh, I remember the <laughs> I, I thought, gee, this is kind of a lot of money you know, right off the bat. <laughs> They said, well, don't worry about it, we'll, we'll just, all we're asking you to do is to co-sign the check and say, <laughs> if, if, if it, the money doesn't come through, I'll, I'll help get it. And so I knew I only had about $28 in my checking account at the moment. <laughs> and I thought, gee, I hope this doesn't ha come happen. No, I was never asked for any money for projects that we, we were on. 
We, we got it from some of these wealthy ladies and so on, who were, they were an immense help. Um, one was this school, well, she was, she was the president of the Women's College in Wheaton. Wheaton College, and uh, she was in a wonderful oh, yeah, financial support right. for, yeah. for us. And we, we had two or three others who were the, just the, every time I, I happened to have, I happened to go after this woman frequently, and she, she, she always said, well, well, I'll help, and then a big check would come in. Mm. <laughs> Elizabeth May. Yeah, good There you. you go. There you go. She's the lady who, who was very, very influential in the development. Um, she was the one who was the head of Wheaton College, and um, uh, this was their summer place and place to come to. Um, she loved Harvard. And Murray Lane, um, Ruth Brown, who lived down there, um, the and trust has done a nice job. The trust waited for 30 years to buy that one. Yeah. It just took forever. And it had one wonderful uh, attraction, in my opinion, and that was one of these um, massive boulders, which... Uh, What's the word for? Him? Yeah, a huge, huge er erratic, erratic, er erratic. Had an erratic yeah. on the top of that. Yeah, yeah, that's way. right there at the end of Murray Lane. Yeah, which yeah. reminds us, um, down in South Harvard, there were a lot of a lot, a lot of erratics on our property. Native American um, stonework, which, which was something that we feel rather passionately about, and we didn't have purposely not told people where. A lot of this is because we were afraid that it was going to get dug up, um, but we do have pictures of some of the well, some of the uh, stuff down there. I'm impressed by how the Harvard Trust has really taken on the trails. It's not um, there's a lot of support I think for it, but um, there's a lot of clearing that's going on, and it makes a huge difference, particularly. I think the last several years we've had so many storms that come through and just wipe everything out. And and the trust has gotten in there and cut it all up. It's very important for my sanity to get out on the trails. I come back refreshed, yeah, and all those... All, you know, I, I can get pretty intense and feel it through your body and you get out on the trails and it just all sorts of goes away. And so you can come back and tackle that issue that you got so upset about, yeah. So it's really, it's very peaceful, yeah. It's a way of getting out um, back to the land, um, the wildlife, the, na the nature. Um, and if you can instill that um, in this next generation, find peace, um, whether you're on horseback or whether you're walking, um, it's kind of a, it's very important. I mean, I feel so badly for people who live in the city and don't know how to get out into the land. Um, so it's a real um, service to humanity. Is to, to, oh, well, that's putting it pretty strongly, but uh, it's an important part of everybody. culture. Otherwise, not to mention <laughs> the uh, global uh, climate change. And I personally, I get very upset when I see trees getting cut down. And the way people will buy land, the first thing they do is, they, oh, we gotta cut down all these trees, it's terrible. 
estate. We need those trees. 